this is a uh, uh, an image from my book, Maps of Meaning. And so, so the idea is that this is the fundamental representation of the unknown as such. It's half spirit because it partakes of the air like a bird, and it's half matter because it, it's on the ground like a like a like a snake, and. And that's what you think is there when you don't know what is there. That's how your body reacts to what's there when you don't know what is there. You know that too, because if you're alone at night, you know, and maybe you're a little rattled up for one reason or another, maybe you watched a horror movie and, you know, there's some weird noise in the other room, it's dark, and you could just try this once. It's like, so you're on edge, you think, you want to turn the light on and go in the room and see. Don't do that. Just open the door a little bit and sneak your hand in. And just watch what your imagination fills that room with, right? And then, then you remember what it's like to be three years old in bed and afraid of the dark. Right? And I read a good book on dragons lately, uh, recently, that, that, that had a very interesting hypothesis about them, I thought. One of the things the guy did was uh, track, I can't remember his name, unfortunately, track how common the image of the dragon was worldwide. It's unbelievably w- widespread. It's crazily widespread. And he thought that this was actually the category of, uh, of primate predator. And the predator was, so predator is a weird category, right? Because like there's, there's crocodiles in it and there's lions and they don't have much in common except they eat you. So it's a functional category. And so this is the, this is the imagistic representation of the functional category of predator. And his predator theory was, well, if you're a monkey, then a bird would pick you off, like an eagle. And so that's this. And then, if it wasn't an eagle, it was a cat, because they climb tre- trees and give you good chomping. And then if it wasn't a cat, then you'd go down on the ground and a snake would get you, or maybe a snake would climb up the tree, because snakes like to do that, and get you. And so that's a, that's a tree, cat, snake, basically. <laughs> tree, cat, snake, bird. And that's the, thing you really, <laughs> that's the thing you really want to avoid. You don't want to come across one of those. And so, and then, you know, the other thing it does is breathe fire, which is quite interesting, because it obviously fire was both greatest friend and greatest enemy of humanity and we've mastered fire for a long time, it might be as long as two or three million years Um, that's what Richard Rangham, I think it's Rangham he wrote a book recently on, I think it was Rangham who wrote a book on when human beings learned to cook that was about two million years ago and cooking increased um, increased the availability of calories you know how chimpanzees are sort of shaped like a big like they're ugly, they're shaped like a big bowling ball, you know, they're really, they look really fat and, it's, and they're short and they're wide and that's because they have intestinal tracts that are like, you know, 300 miles long and the reason for that is because they have to digest leaves and so you go out in the forest and like sit there and eat leaves for a whole day and see how that works out for you, you know, they have, they have no calories in them, so chimps spend about, I think it was, I think it's eight hours a day chewing and it's because what they eat has no nutritional value and then they have to have this tremendous gut in order to extract anything at all out of it and human beings at some point just thought, oh to hell with that, we'll cook something and then we traded our gut for brain which, you know, more or less has worked and I think it's made us a lot more attractive as well Uh, (laughs) so, okay, well, so the idea here was that well, that's the basic archetype of the unknown as such and then, I like the St. George version of this, it's so cool because St. George lives in a, like a castle, and the castle is partly falling down, and it's partly because there's a dragon that's come up to, like it's an eternal dragon, it's come back to give everyone a rough time, which always happens, because there's an, the eternal dragon is always given, are, giving our fallen down castles a rough time, always. And so then St. George is the hero who goes out to confront the dragon, and he frees the virgin from its grasp. And I would say that's a pretty straightforward story about the sexual attractiveness of the masculine spirit that's willing to forthrightly encounter the unknown it looks just straight, looks like a straight biological representation to me and it's a really, really old story right, it's the oldest written story we have and that's basically the Mesopotamian creation myth, the Enuma Elish which which basically lays out precisely that story and so, and it's replayed, I mean I bet you the moviegoers among you, especially the ones that are more attracted to the superhero, you know, the really flashy sort of superhero type movies, you've probably seen the St. George story like 150 times in the last 10 years you never get tired of it because it's the central story of mankind so you've got the unknown as such and that is what you react to with your body in the existential terror and extraordinary curiosity are gripping you and then 
it's like the unknown unknowns that, uh, who's the politician under Bush? Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld. Yeah, I think the reason that that phrase caught on so well is because he nailed an archetype. There's unknown unknowns and there's known unknowns. And that's the unknown unknown. And you have to be able to react to an unknown unknown because they can get you. And you can't just plead ignorance because then you're dead. That doesn't work. Like, human beings are the sort of creature who has to know what to do when they don't know what to do. And that's very paradoxical. And what we do is we prepare to do everything. That's right. We're on guard. We prepare to do everything. Very, very stressful. And, but also very engaging. And very, very much something that heightens consciousness. And maybe those circuits are ter permanently turned on in human beings because we also know that we're going to die. And no other animal knows that. And so sometimes I think that our that our stress circuits are just on all the time. And that's part of what accounts for our heightened consciousness. So, you have your unknown unknowns, and then you have your relatively... You have the unknowns that you actually encounter in the world, like the mystery of your, of your uh, uh, romantic partner when you have a fight with them. It's like, well, we're having a fight. So who, who the hell are you? I mean, you're not the absolute unknown, because I know something about you, but you're the unknown as it's manifesting itself to me right now. Right? And, and, and then there's the, the known that we inhabit, and then there's the knower. And the known is, is given symbolic representation, as far as I've been able to tell, in patriarchal form, in the form of male deities. And the unknown, as you encountered, is given feminine form. So, um, we won't get into that too much, but, but if you're interested in that, you could look at my Maps of Meanings lectures, or maybe take a look at the book. Uh, but I, I, think it's a good, I think it's a good schema for religious archetypes. I've, I've worked on it a long time. It seems to fit the Jungian criteria quite nicely. It maps nicely onto Joseph Campbell's ideas. He, he got almost all his ideas from Jung, however. Um, and it also makes sense from a biological and an evolutionary perspective, as far as I can tell. That's a lot of cross-validation, at least in my estimation. So, okay, so back to the hierarchy of dominance. Well, let's take a look at it a little bit. So, I'm, I'm quite enamored of lobsters, as some of you might know. Because I found out, this just blew me away when I found it out. I mean, I, I've done a lot of work in neurochemistry, functional neurochemistry, because I used to study alcoholism and drug abuse. And alcoholism, to study alcohol, you have to know a lot about the brain, because alcohol goes everywhere in the brain. It affects every neurochemical system. And so if you're going to study alcohol, you kind of have to study neurochemistry in general. And so I did that for quite a long time. I, I really got enamored of a book called The Neuropsychology of Anxiety by Jeffrey Gray, which is an absolute work of genius, although extraordinarily diff like it, I don't know how many references that book has, it's like, it must be a thousand. And Gray actually read them. And worse, he understood them. And then, and then, he, and then he integrated them in, into this book, and so to read it, you have to really master functional neurochemistry and animal behaviorism and, and uh, motivation and emotion and neuroanatomy. Like, it's a killer book, but man, it's really rich. And, it's taken psychologists about 40 years to really unpack that book. But one of the things I learned about that was just exactly how much continuity there was in the neurochemistry of human beings and the neurochemistry of animals. It's absolutely staggering. It's, it's the sort of thing that makes the fact of evolution something like self-evident. I do think it's self-evident for other reasons that I'll, I'll tell you about later. I think evolution, or I think natural selection, random mutation and natural selection is the only way you can solve the problem of how to deal with an environment that's complex beyond your ability to comprehend. I think what you do is you generate endless variants because God only knows what the hell's going to happen next. They all, almost all of them die because they're failures and a couple propagate. And you know, the environment keeps moving around like a giant snake. You never know what it's going to do next. And so the best you can do is say, well, here's 30 things that might work and you know, 28 of them are going to perish. If you're, or if you're an insect, it's like the ratio is way, way higher than that. So, anyways, back to the lobsters. You know, these, so these creatures engage in, in dominance disputes. And, and I think dominance is the right way to think about it, because lobsters aren't very empathic, and they're not very social. And so it really is the toughest lobster that wins. You know, and what's so cool about the lobster is that when, when a lobster wins, he flexes and gets bigger. So he looks bigger. Because he's a winner, it's like he's advertising that. And the biological, the neurochemical system that makes him flex is serotonergic. And you think, well, who cares? What the hell does that mean? Well, tell you what it means. It's the same chemical that's affected by antidepressants in human beings. And so, like, if you're depressed, you're a defeated lobster. Like, you're, you're like this. I'm small. I'm not, you know, things are dangerous. I don't want to fight. 
You give someone an antidepressant, it's like up they stretch, and then they're ready to like take on the world again. Well, if you give lobsters who just got defeated in a fight serotonin, then they stretch out and they'll fight again. And that's like we separated from those creatures on the evolutionary time scale somewhere between 350 and 600 million years ago, and the damn neurochemistry is the same. And so that's another indication of just how important hierarchies of authority are. I mean, they've been conserved since the time of lobsters, right? There weren't trees around when lobsters first, first manifested themselves on the planet. And so what that means is these hierarchies that I've been talking about, those things are older than trees. And so, one of the truisms for what constitutes real from a Darwinian perspective is that which has been around the longest period of time, right? Because it's had the longest period of time to exert selection pressure. Well, we know we evolved and lived in trees, something on the order of 60 million years ago. We're talking 10 times as far back as that for the hierarchy. And so the idea that human beings, that the hierarchy is something that has exerted selection pressure on human beings is, I don't think that's a disputable, that's not a disputable uh, issue. How it's done it and exactly what that means, we can argue about, but like that sort of biological continuity is just absolutely unbelievable. I, um, it was funny because I revealed this finding, you know, I didn't discover this, I read about it, but I talked to my graduate students about it, I used to take them out for breakfast, you know, and they were a very contentious, snappy bunch. And, uh, and they were always trying to one-up each other, and they were quite witty, and for like six months, until it got very annoying, every time one of them one up the other, they'd stretch themselves out and like snap their hands like... <laughs> <laughs> so, that was, that was very funny, it was, it was really very funny. So you see this in lobsters, and so that's pretty amazing. So, yeah, and one of the other things that's really cool about lobsters is that, um, let's say you've been like top lobster for a long time, but you're getting kind of old, and some young lobster just, you know, wails the hell out of you, and, and so you're all depressed. But the thing is, your brain is dominant. But you don't have much of a brain because you're a lobster, and so now what are you going to do? Because you just lost. And the answer is, well, your brain will dissolve. And then you'll grow a subordinate brain. Yeah, and so that's worth thinking about too, right? Here, for a couple of reasons. First of all, if any of you have ever been seriously defeated in life, you know what that's like. It's like it's a death, a descent, a, a dissolution, and if you're lucky, a regrowth. And, and maybe not as the same person. That's what happens to people with post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Their brains undergo permanent neurological transformation. And, and they then inhabit a world that's much more dangerous than the world that they inhabited to begin with. But we also know, too, if you have post-traumatic stress disorder or depression, that your hippocampus shrinks, right? It dies and shrinks. And you can sometimes get it to grow back. Your hippocampus shrinks and your amygdala grows. And the amygdala increases emotional sensitivity. And the hippocampus inhibits emotional sensitivity. And so if you've been badly defeated, the hippocampus shrinks and the amygdala grows. Now, if you recover, the hippocampus will regrow. And antidepressants actually seem to help that, but the damn amygdala never shrinks again. And so, well, so that's another lesson from the lobster. It's quite a terrifying one, but, but it's one, like, it's so interesting that you can relate to that, right? It's like, I get what that poor crustacean's going through, you know. <laughs> so, okay, here's the rats, and this is from Yak Panksepp's work. Rat, he was the first guy who figured out that rats giggle. And you might think, well, what kind of stupid thing is that to study? It's like $50,000 research grant for giggling rats, you know? So, <laughs> but uh, he discovered the play circuitry in mammals. That's a big deal, right? It's like discovering a whole new continent. There's a play circuit in mammals. It's built right in, so it's not socially constructed. There's a, there's a biological platform for that. And so what, what, what Panksepp would do with rats, he found out if rats, if you take a rat pup away from its mother, it dies. Even if you feed it, even if you keep it warm, it dies. Now, you can stop it from dying by taking a pencil with an eraser on the end and massaging it, right? Because rats won't live without love. And the same thing happens to human babies. And we, we saw that in Romania when there was that catastrophe after Ceausescu in the orphanages, where the orphanages were full of unwanted babies because Ceausescu insisted that every Romanian woman was constantly pregnant. So the orphanages stacked up with unwanted babies, and lots of them didn't even have names. And they were warehoused, warmth, Shelter, food, devastating. Lots of them died. Most of them died before the first year. And the ones that didn't die were permanently dysfunctional. Because 
You have to be touched if you're a human being. It's not an option. You have to be played with. It's not an option. It's, it's part of neurodevelopmental necessity. And, and you have to also play fair. So, because otherwise you produce a very disjointed child who isn't able to engage in the niceties of social interaction, which is continual play, in some sense, and reciprocity. So what Pangsep did with his rats, he noticed that male rats, juveniles, really like to wrestle. And they wrestle just like human beings wrestle. They pin each other for crying out loud. It's like that, that rat has just lost. He's down for a 10 count, right? And so, so what you do is you take juvenile rats, and you can find out that they want to play, because you can attach a spring to them and then they'll try to run and you can measure how hard they're running by how hard they're pulling on the spring and then you can estimate how motivated they are and so you can find out that a nice well-fed rat who doesn't have anything on his mind will still work hard to play if it, to enter a, an arena where he's been allowed to play before he'll work for that so then you think well the rat's motivated so the two rats go out there and they play and, and so they're, they're playing like dogs play, and everyone knows what that looks like. If, if, you're, you know, if you have any sense about dogs, they kind of go like this, and kids do that, and maybe you do that with your wife if you're going to play with her a little bit. <laughs> my, poor, my poor wife, man, when she... <laughs> she was, a, she was a, a, a young... She had older siblings, and so she wasn't played with as much when she was little as she might have been. And um, I used to, like... You know, if you take a pillow, eh, and you go like this, three times, right? That means, look out, a pillow is coming your way. So I'd go, one, two, three, whap! And she, she looked, she was completely dismayed at me. She's like, what do you do that for? And I thought, well, I, I eventually taught her that rule. The other thing I used to do... <laughs> the other thing I used to do, you know, is she said, so sometimes she'd come at me like this when we were playing around. And I'd grab her wrists and I'd knock her, 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 her hands, her, her knuckles together. And she used to just get completely annoyed about that. And I thought, right? That's what you do. You just open your hands. Well, she didn't know that either. So she hadn't been played with enough when she was a little rat. And so, <laughs> anyways, uh, anyway, so you let the, rat, the little rats go out there, right? And so let's imagine one of them is 10% bigger than the other. And so the 10% bigger rat wins, because 10% is enough in rat weight to ensure that you're going to be the, the pinner rather than the pinny. Okay, so, so that's fine. So and then the, rat, the rat pins, the big rat pins the little rat, and now the big rat is the, is the authority rat. And so then the next time that the rats play, the little rat has to invite the big rat to play. So the big rat's out there being cool, and the little rat pops up and, you know, does the whole will you play with me thing, and the big rat will deign to play with them. But if you pair them repeatedly, unless the big rat lets the little rat win 30% of the time, the little rat will not invite him to play. And Panksepp discovered that. It's like, I read that, that just blew me away. It's like, that is so amazing. Because you see, well, first of there, there's an analogy to Piaget's ideas about the emergence of morality out of play in human beings. So that was very cool. But the notion that that was built into rats at the level of wrestling was, and they're social, they're deeply social animals, right? They have to know how to get along with one another. And most of their authority disputes, dominance disputes, you don't want them to end in bloodshed and, and combat. Because, you know, if you're rat one and I'm rat two and we tear each other to shreds in a dominance dispute, rat three is just going to move in. It's really not a great strategy. And so it'd be better if we could settle our differences, you know, somewhat peacefully. And so, well, so rats... Anyways, Pankshep figured out that rats play. And not only do they play, they play fair and they seem to enjoy it. He also figured out, this was really cool too, that if you give juvenile rats attention deficit disorder drugs, Ritalin suppresses prey, play. So that's worth thinking about. It's like, well, why do you have to give juvenile human beings amphetamines in school? Well, because they need to play. Well, you don't, they don't get to play. They don't get to wrestle around. I mean, that's oppression as far as I can tell. They don't get to wrestle around. That's fine. Feed them some amphetamines, man. That'll shut down the old play circuits. Well, here's the other problem is Panksepp found out that if you don't let juvenile male rats play, their prefrontal cortexes don't develop properly. Surprise, surprise, you're not letting them mature. It's like, what else would you expect? So, you know, that's something to think about. <laughs>